All right, welcome to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Samuel? Well, we are on our Wheel of Time, Crown of Swords episode for this week. And uh, realistically, the, I think the main theme is a conflict between the sexes. So I wanted to read a passage from Evolution of Desire by David Buss on sexual, in the chapter Sexual Conflict. Novel songs, soap operas, and tabloids tell us about battles between men and women and the pain they inflict on each other. Wives bemoan their husbands' neglect. Husbands are bewildered by their wives' moodiness. Men are emotionally constricted, say women. Women are emotional powder kegs, say men. Men want sex too soon, too fast. Women impose frustrating delays. Are these stereotypes? And then he goes into all the ways that's correct. If we extend mating to just relationships and cooperation, we have a lot of that going on in this chapter or these these next couple chapters of uh, of this book. Yeah, I've been thinking since you you you've been talking about some kind of your your hypotheses and theories on interaction between the sexes in our in our sexy time talks. Um, and I've been trying to come up with a better word than conflict because that has a very negative connotation. And there's certainly going to be tension because we we think in very different ways. Well, I mean, conflict is the term used. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's basically the clashing of opposing strategies. And the way we think is molded around the, the pursuit of those strategies. Mm-hmm. So men's matter of factness, men's, you know, problem solving and not sitting there talking about your emotions, as we brought up before, keeps you from getting run over by mammoth while you're cooperating with the other men that are trying to 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 take this mammoth down with you. Instead of saying, well, if you want to be on this side today, you can come over here. I mean, you you looked at me a little Squish. different when I said go to that side. So I, I just think you're harboring some emotion that, you know. No, it's we kill mammoth, and if successful, everybody gets along, even if you didn't do the job you did, you wanted to do. So it's uh, all of the things in men's men's thinking are balanced around the differences in strategy going through this world. We're also bigger and stronger, so we tend to 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 go the more stoic but cooperative route for two reasons. First of all, big game hunting, and the second one is we're social animals. And if you're not a good cooperative group, well, then the next most cooperative group is going to come and take, take your food and your women mm -hmm. and your shelter, and you'll probably be dead. And On the other end, women are, we're, we, we have, uh, you know, a, a, a gap between the size and strength of the two sexes, overlapping bell curves, all the same disclaimers. So they have to have a different collational model. And they have to do it in a way that doesn't disrupt the the community. And they're always together without any specific driven goals. They're just, they're, they're taking care of, and it's not like, you know, you have to have this coordinated strategy to get all the potatoes picked in the area and all the berries picked and then uh, prepare the meat that the men br bring back and all of, all of the things around what was female culture obviously mm -hmm. we live in a different day and age now which in the social episodes we get into why that causes a lot of dysfunction but going back to our evolutionary roots everything we did for survival had two distinct strategies which caused us to have two distinct minds male female uh with the caveat of the weird the 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 what's the what's the word that's not going to get us canceled to talk about someone having a, a a gender dysmorphic mind. We'll just leave it at that. A gender dysmorphic mind. <laughs> uh, but uh, w the exception to the rule aside, we did develop these different strategies for life, which caused us to have different ways of thinking. But the problem is, and the conflict happens when we try to either impose our way of thinking on the opposite sex, or we, uh, in, in evolution of desire, he calls it sexual mind reading, which is always the opposite of what, the, the 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 person trying to mate it has in mind uh well we, we just call it uh you know 
the improper mind reading of the opposite sex at this point, because, and we're going to see a lot of that with oh, yeah. Eve and, you know, Matt and, 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 and everybody. And, and that's something I kind of teased last time about that, which, which to me is one of the things so interesting about this storyline, going back to the, the end of Lord of chaos, where this storyline started and, you know, we, we have the meme of all the conflict and all the problems in this story is lack of information, but it's more than just people don't know things. It's people don't communicate with each other, so they don't know. But it's it's worse here because it's not it's not just the not knowing, it's the assumptions. And 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 you can make assumptions about things. You have to make assumptions about things because we always work with incomplete data, but where things get really dangerous, whether it's uh politics or philosophy or especially interpersonal relationships is when you start assuming someone else's motives. Well, and it's important because our brain as we especially as we get older gets really good at categorizing and separating the important from the not important because if you were aware of everything in your environment all the time, you would go fucking crazy. And, and a, your brain would overload. There, so, it's a, an interesting thought experiment. Um one of my favorite sci-fi authors Timothy Zahn who wrote the best and t possibly only good uh, expanded universe Star Wars books? In, in one of his uh, uh, homebrew uh, worlds that he created in kind of a near future, he has this uh, elite group of space fighter pilots. And what makes them so elite is that, and this was before Matrix, I think, they eat. You jack into their brain at the base of the skull, and it gives them 360 degree vision because their brain is synced with the sensors of the spaceship. And what makes them so elite is how many people wash out, go crazy, or become brain damaged. Because even more than just your usual special forces physicalness, now you're messing with the brain and trying to make it do something that it is not wired to well, it, do it's it's going to have to take circuitry from other parts of the brain to mm -hmm. enhance the uh the the optical the op the the word optometrist is based on the <laughs> the part of your brain that uh, that uh translates the light coming into your eyeball so it it's going to have to recircuit Mm -hmm. other parts of your brain which would probably take away from other senses would be the most likely place yeah. as we see with with someone who goes blind like later in life their brain rewires to you can basically start hearing shapes and and, and, and a, zon's zon actually has a bit of an explanation for that as well is that they start to lose their humanity they start to get on the spectrum basically is what we would say today is they start to lose their social skills because they're so technically minded that, that they, they, I mean, that it makes those sense. start to yeah. atrophy. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. You want, once you're an adult, you kind of have this, you kind of have mostly the, you, you can, you can make new circuits, but at the same time, it's slow and far between. So what your brain typically does is remodel and take away. And again, I was talking about, you can't be aware of everything. Your brain gets good at taking out what's important to you. You know, mm -hmm. uh, different cultures see colors differently, like uh, Russian and northern, uh, very far north cultures, uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, etc. Their language is different around the color blue, and they can see more shades of the color blue than mm -hmm. we can over here because it's important when everything's covered in ice to differentiate between the different things that are in there that are all colored blue. So, um, well, what I wanted to say with, with, with regards to the genders, the sexes is are just like we talk about with mathematical models to predict, you know, how a pandemic is going to turn out or, you know, what the economic plan is going to, which economic plan should we pursue in this situation? Our brain does that with interactions as well. So you're already modeling how the interaction should go. Problem is you have a serious cognitive bias because you are either man or woman or something in between. Mm -hmm. So you have this huge cognitive bias that gets in the way of creating a proper model. And in a, in a time like this, we didn't have 
podcasts and eBooks and, you know, uh, uh, Amazon can send you something that you can learn how to remodel, mm-hmm. co- uh, cognitively remodel. So they're basically just going on their experience. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said something that was, was, uh, was about to get me back off that tangent and back into the specifics here, because you said something about how um uh different different goals that your your brain prioritizes it has different goals and that is going to be different between the sexes and one of the things i teased last time that's really interesting to me about this storyline that i hadn't really thought of in these terms until we started talking about it in this way is that Nynaeve and Brigitte are two of if not the most you probably throw out the end in there the most masculine female characters in the series. They are both very masculine, and yet they both act very differently, especially when it comes to Matt. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the reasons for that that we'll see in the in these chapters is that even though they're both, both very masculine in personality, Birgitte has far more experience with men in men's spheres of of action and influence. So they're both on the same side, so to speak. They're both pointed towards the same goal. But Birgitte is better able to understand how Matt's looking at the problem. Mm -hmm. So she can get along with him a lot better, whereas Nynaeve is just, and Elaine, uh, Elaine is just more diplomatic about it. They're both assuming the worst. Somewhat about in these chapters. Somewhat. Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. So they're both assuming the worst about Matt. Uh, and it's and it's not even that they're, you know, coming at it purposely from that mode. It's not a it's it's not a case of expect the worst so that your price your surprises are pleasant ones. That's just their reflexive reaction to matt so let's go ahead and get into the book because we're just in the second chapter we're 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 understanding matt and he has other cognitive bias other than just across the 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 sexes because it opens up with him basically the 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 aftermath of him being mugged Mm -hmm. where of course he came out of it the better because chapter 21 swove on night on mm-hmm. page uh, 456 of our paperback versions here and he's he's mugged by what look like beggars which we can already assume from context clues earlier in the book with the uh with Keridan and uh, the the fox face lady and in all of that interaction that this is probably something mm-hmm. uh, what old cully is up to uh but at the end of the the the, the second chapter of the whole or se- second paragraph of the whole chapter uh which is the top of 457 the fellows certainly had been optimistic about what they would find in his pockets the thing could have covered him head to knees talking about the bag mm-hmm. what we get with matt when we're kind of over analyzing him as a character is he's actually the complete opposite of a narcissist he 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 ends up with a lot of attention, but he's not an attention seeker. And mm-hmm. and there, it's never always me, me, me. He's always goal, other person, helping this, over. It's never about Matt. Matt just wants to get out of there and have a quiet life. But then he can't handle a quiet life, so he that, ends up back in it. That is a very interesting analysis because he... He comes across, you would, on the surface, you would think he was a more narcissistic because he's more flamboyant. He's more accepting of the spotlight, even if he doesn't seek it out. But to your point, in that way, he's a lot like Perrin. Yeah. They just have very different personalities. Perrin is much more dour and stoic. Well, he's also they're... more introverted. And, and mm-hmm. Matt mm-hmm. comes across as center of attention because he's very extroverted. But he's just trying to have fun. He's not trying to yes. get attention. Yes. But they're they they are both great examples of um the the uh aphorism that, that the the best people to wield power are the ones who don't want it. Yeah. And, and actually that's an interesting contrast with how this how this 
particular book ends with Rand, that he started off that way, but he's starting to become his own worst enemy in that mm-hmm. sense. He, he starts to become, the word would be entitled. The the, the, the power corrupting, and he, mm. I mean, you can't get much more absolute power than what Rand has. Yeah, so, so the main point there is he's so lacking in that 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 on the bell curve of the trait narcissism that he's actually missing a very important point that would have helped him out greatly in this whole journey in Ibu Dar. Oh my gosh, there's beg there are there's someone that has access or uh these beggars were actually trying to get me and then there is a plot actual plot to get me in this town mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i need to follow that thread as well as the keratin thread as well as the fox lady thread as well as what he finds out here later what why he's actually here which mm-hmm. is one of the big major miscommunications was they never told him why they were there so he in the in the i'm a man and i'm mission driven sense his mission is to get them back to camelin safe and that's all he's thinking about. Because notice how he immediately turns around when he figure when they tell him what the reason he's there is. It, and it 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 goes hilariously and perfectly well with uh with with that great scene between him and Tom back in Lord of Chaos, where Tom is telling him, you know, about the about the cobbler's wife. And stop make stop making. Stop thinking that you're going to make these women do what you think they should do and start figuring out how you're going to help them accomplish what they think they need to do. And you see that, you know, to an extent uh, when when they're saying their farewells and Matt can read the situation and he hops down off his horse and he makes this big flourish of a bow and he glares at his men to get down off their horses and drop to a knee in front of a Gwaine. Because he he may not agree, he may not like it, he may not know everything that's going on, but once he sees what Egwene is trying to do and sees the obstacles in front of her, he's going to do his little part to give her her authority, to help her establish her authority. All right, then it starts to get fun. Then it starts to get fun. All right, so uh, I'm I'm just following your lead here. Where do you want to? No, no, you to? you keep going through, and I'll stop us in the points where I don't care. Yeah, because sure. yeah, you do like the play by play. Um. Ah, yes. Uh, and then poor Matt. He's he's trying to put the moves on and be be smooth <laughs> with the ladies, uh, but he has a gilded woman in his in his room waiting for him. So why does he want gilded fish? Uh, yeah, which of course is utterly confusing to Matt because that's the kind of thing that from from your opening quote there from that book is men not understanding women, not understanding their moods. Mm-hmm. Well, they get in these moods because these kinds of situations strike them emotionally, whereas Matt's just looking at it objective oriented and going huh because in his mind it's like i didn't ask who who is this woman and what does this have to do with anything this has nothing to do with me you know flipping you a tip and giving you a wink and being friendly to you that these two things don't go together what's going on here which you get you get a testament of matt's charisma there because this is why women in these serving roles make so much money in, in even in modern society because Men overestimate a woman's interest and women tend to underestimate a man's interest. Mm. And so that plays very well if you're looking for steady tips from guys because they're going to keep <laughs> tipping and tipping and tipping uh, with a with your wink and a smile. Whereas the, the roles were reversed here. The serving girl thought his intentions were more than he, he was actually advertising because he was tipping and giving a wink and a smile and and so that that's actually you know if it was done on purpose it's a testament to his charisma if it was done on accident that's jordan not knowing the 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 dynamic as well as we'd hope he would so we're going to assume because we 
he's he we're he, we're pos- mm-hmm. posthumously praising him in most situations that he knew what he was talking about there. And, and from the other interactions we see, like in in the beginning of Lord of Chaos, when he's with the band in that that Andor town, and you know, Matt likes a a smile and a dance and maybe a little cuddling canoodle for all of the man whoring that he gets accused of, especially by Nynaeve, who's exceptionally prudish. Um, he's not really that much of a man whore. He, like you say, he just likes to have fun. And for the most part, it's fairly innocent fun because mm. he's still a small town kid. It, yeah. Cause to other than Melindra, was that her name? The Ayo? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you really get the impression that it, at, at this point, he really only gets to like second base. Mm-hmm. Other uh, other than her, the, you know, there might mm-hmm. be some inst- instances they just doesn't go into, but he, you know, he talks about having a roll in the hay every once in a while and uh, canoodling and dawdling and you know all of the words he uses, but that's like second base stuff. That's like making out and maybe a it, little groping. It's, yeah. it, it's it's like you know nineteen fifties film stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, co- romance is, is is kind of what it seems like to me most of the time. Um, which, which is what I think is going on there is that his uh, with Kyra is just his kind of natural, mostly harmless flirtation. Mm-hmm. Um, a- and then his brain hits him like a ton of bricks. Um, yep. Where we get we get the flashback to the Great Hunt, and and I uh, always like when Jordan throws in one of his real memories in the same way he throws in the, the old people, the old because it's yeah. more and more, it's smushing together and he can't mm-hmm. tell the difference. Uh, and actually I, I, is, is this c- copied and pasted from that scene in, I, I think it two? is because that scene reading it out again, actually made kind of like the hairs in the back of my neck come up and a little kind of goose pimply. It's, it's really well written. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and even with all these names that it's a testament to how great his writing is, because this isn't like if he started naming the Knights of the Round Table is what it would be for us. We don't know who these people are, but yet he's able to give us a sense through Matt's perspective of the the awe the, that he has with these people mm-hmm. that. It would be like that for us if these people showed up, these absolutely legendary heroes showed up in the flesh and and were able to. Well, and I think this is something we talked about early on is Jordan borrows from uh, these other uh, folklore of of, Mm -hmm. of our times, not just to give the impression that we were a previous age or something along those lines where all the yep. speculation the is wheel of time. and the wheel is yeah. keep, keeps going. But the other part of it is you already have an impression in your mind about these people. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't have to spend 20 pages explaining who somebody is. So yes. you can have, the, especially you, you within, get that effect already. Especially with one of the more blatant names, which there's a reason it's blatant is because it needs to really have that immediate impact. Arthur Hawkwing. King Arthur, you know, uh, the high king, um, which is funny I, because one of these is Pendrag, which mm-hmm. our King Arthur was Arthur mm-hmm. Pendrag. And so he kind of, he kind of mix and matches there as we, we Frank and mm-hmm. Franken story this, but, um, well, no, I think the Pendrag, oh, that's, pa- I think, that's Pedrig. No, pa- is, Pendrag comes from one of Arthur Hawkwing's son. I think that's the line that the Sanchin trace. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So this so, one was Pedrig. It P A E D R G. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he uses, he uses that, that root name of, uh, Pendragon and, and he, he uses it as, uh, uh, the successors. Anyway, I, I really love this scene, the way it unfolds with, uh, Birgit and Matt kind of opening up to each other and the banter, Matt complaining about the girls and you have your own secrets, folding her arms under her breast. She sat on the foot of the bed, which uh, that was on looked. purpose. Yep. <laughs> hey, she knows, she knows how good looking she is and she knows what guys like. We have mm-hmm. already seen that and we're going to see it even more as she starts to hang out with Matt. Um, the way she looked at him, you would have thought he was a tavern puzzle for one. 
You've not told them you blew the horn of Valer, the smallest of your secrets from them, I think. Which apparently he had, and they never told her. So I wish he had said that part out loud here, but mm -hmm. he just thinks it. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, kudos to them and kudos to Matt for giving them credit. It shows it, it, it's a tiny thing that I hadn't really noticed before that shows um, just how wrong the girls are and how um, I think altruism is too strong of a word, but uh, how supportive Matt is or would be if they would just, you know, open up and let him in. Um, because while they're thinking the worst about him, uh, he, he just kind of assumed they would keep his secret and is kind of surprised they didn't break the confidence. They didn't divulge the secret, even though there's no reason not to, because she's actually her. She's actually Birgit. So it wouldn't, but on the other hand, it would still be breaking a secret. So, you know, kudos kudos to him. Um, what secrets do I have? Uh, those women know my toenails in dreams. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have the wrong in, Horn Sounder. I do not command them. I am Elaine's warder. I obey. Birgit Silverbow. Faith of the Light, I'm not sure I'm still that woman. So much of what I was and knew has faded like mist beneath the summer sun since my strange new birth. And there's something that I didn't really pick up on until the second or third reread is the 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 parallel that Jordan is drawing here between Matt and Bergie. Because she's kind of going in the opposite direction. All those extra memories are kind of fusing and, and becoming part of Matt and making him more, whereas Bergie is actually losing all of those previous lives and memories that she had. Mm -hmm. So they have kind of a, a parallel course, but one is losing and one is gaining. Well, I mean, you could probably make a case for, she might not be losing them, but they are blending with the her now. And again, the rewiring of the circuitry, what's important now, What the, what's important is the world I live in now, where what's important to Matt is surviving in this new world he lives in, which which is full of danger. Yeah. And the, the new world he lives in full of danger, these memories are actually very important for him. And as for your secrets, what language do we speak, Horn Sounder? But, uh... and, and then, whoopsie. Whoopsie. And, and to that point of rewiring and merging is, once again, as happens sometimes, he just carry. He didn't just speak a phrase or two. He's carrying on an entire conversation with a natural speaker in the old tongue. Oops. Uh, which she points out and then has a good laugh at him trying to rationalize because, to your point. He just wants to have fun. He just wants to live his life. He doesn't want the spotlight. And, you know, be able to rationalize it away as, uh, 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 an ace that I once told me the old blood runs strong in, what the bloody hell are you laughing at? <laughs> because that's, an, as Brigitte points out, that's an absurd rationalization. It doesn't hold water at all. But, but if he can rationalize it away as just this glitch, then... He's nothing special. Just, hey, I'm just me. Just leave me alone yeah. and let me have a good time. But then we have just just after that another moment of misreading because of his his model of women. Mm. You know, burn me, I need a drink. Before that was out of his mouth, he knew it was the wrong thing to say. Women never, oh, that sounds good to me. <laughs> that sounds the right notion to me. Yeah. I could use a pitcher of wine myself. Blood and ashes when I saw you'd recognize me. I nearly swallowed my tongue. He sat up straight as if he had been jerked, staring. Down they go to drink a whole pitcher or five. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I like that we cut away from that now because he he gave us you know 
he gave us the great icebreaker of, okay, now the storylines are finally going to merge. The secrets to some extent are going to come out. And, uh, and he's also, you know, doing a great setup here for what we know is to come, which is some really hilarious chapters with Matt and Bergeet interacting together. Um, you know, it, it, my my favorites being when when she, you know, when they're in one of the festivals, the carnivals, where they're barely wearing anything, and she's nudging him to, hey, check out that one over there. She's got a nice rack, mm -hmm. you know, which is you're not supposed to do as a girl. But geez. oh no, every every guy you cherish that 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 female friend that's a little bit more masculine and fun, and they're the best at pointing them out. Oh, awesome. you'll like her, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, it, yeah. and it's not that I, I've um, I've seen some annoying forum threads on you know basically saying that Bergie is bisexual. It's no. She just knows Matt. Matt is a mm -hmm. friend and she knows what he likes and what he's going to like to look at. Mm -hmm. And she can appreciate aesthetically that, hey, she's a hottie. That doesn't mean you're inherently sexually attracted. Stop trying to shove things that aren't there. Yeah, you and this can is recognize that, you know, you can recognize that. Uh, what was the example that Baloo used? Oh, Brad Pitt at his height. Brad, uh, Fight Club Brad Pitt of, I know you're going to find him attractive. That's damn sexy. You can say that without being sexually attracted to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's actually an important skill to have if you're talking about secure security of your own mate. Because mm -hmm. if you know what your mate likes, you know when to spot a mate poach but, on but the horizon. It's, it's also, it, it kind of weakens what's actually going on here, which is how well Bergy knows the male mind. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just, you know, some something something hot caught, you, uh, you know, we, we could be sitting down at my favorite restaurant, Twin Peaks, and, you know, there's a new waitress and it's, whoa, hey, wow. And it's, whoa, hey, wow, because there's that, uh, that sexual thrill that goes on in my lizard brain. That's not what's happening with Birgit. She's she doesn't get that thrill and say, "Oh man, you know, check her out." It's well, it's a it's, it's a merging analytical. of two things. It's a merging of her understanding men, and mm -hmm. this is the kind of things they look for, and her female intuition to actually get it right mm -hmm. when you're actually learning somebody based on what they tell you, based on the way they look at people. You know, she's watching yep. him watch yep. girls, and she notices a pattern which is intuitive to the female mind. They're pattern driven, and then she just keeps perpetuating the pattern. And, and at the same time, I, I don't remember when we actually get there, but she is also dressed up with feathers just barely covering the bits that need to be covered. And she says, "Hey, it's nice to be looked at sometimes." So she's, and we're not allowed to say this, and this is when you get canceled. Is yeah, that's how women think. They just often don't consciously think that or won't let themselves consciously think that because, you know, to, to the point you've made, that is to, to preen like that is to threaten the female coalition because you're... You're driving down mate value. You're driving down mate value. You're threatening the other women who are part of your coalition. Guys can threaten each other because it's a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. you, you already know that that guy is already, you know, above you because it's already been established or you're trying to establish it. But now, I digress because yeah, first we get Elaine the getting yeah. drunk, which is hilarious. Um, Oh, but even before we get there is more of Nynaeve's naiveness, which just reinforces that it isn't just a Matt thing. Although Matt gets a, gets kind of a an extra dose of it because he grew up with her as kind of a um, surrogate older sister, and then she got into a position of power and kind of became a you know, a, a surrogate mother or, or or the surrogate strict aunt, a and Matt is the so. So my mom is a has been a teacher 
off and on her whole adult life. So there are certain of my friends that she just automatically kind of, I won't say doesn't like, but is giving the side eye to because she can recognize, oh, you were the you're the class clown. She just instinctively, oh, you're the class clown. I have to keep an eye on you. Uh, like T. That's how she. <laughs> the first time she was around T, and he was like, "Does your mom not like me?" No, I think she just knows that you're the class clown, and she needs to keep an eye on you to keep you on task. And Nynaeve is like that with Matt because he was the village clown, but she still has that kind of negative impulse towards men, which which probably comes to a large degree, even though. She was raised by her father, but in her position of power, it was constant conflict with men. It was the women's circle and the village council. So that's only going to reinforce any negative thoughts she has, which she pushes on to Julian and, and Tom with the, are you sure you didn't tell him anything? And Julian is, you know... A little bit offended, a little bit exasperated of, you keep asking me this and I keep telling you the same answer, but you're a woman, I'm a man, and we don't understand each other. And to for Nynaeve, you don't really try to understand mm -hmm. until a little bit later when, you know, ma Mama needs it bad and she finally gets it good. Uh, oh, there I go, canceling us again. Yeah. Outrage innocent is... is <laughs> was one of the things men did best, especially when they're guilty as foxes in a hen, hen yard. Like, no, no. You, the, one of the things that does piss me off the most is when I get accused of something I never did. Because mm -hmm. I do enough bad things. Stick with those. You yeah, know? well, and it, it, it's exponentially worse because when it's, hey, did you do this? That's annoying because, no, I didn't do that. But if it's a question and you can explain yourself, all right, well, at least it's it's done with. But when it's, no, you did. I'm like, I just explained to you how I didn't. Well, Tom is the one that goes on to explain mm -hmm. because he talks about they didn't even have time. You know, you didn't even tell us this until this moment. And, and then Elaine starts getting, it is a night for carousing. <laughs> uh... Even if Elaine had not been under her eye, though, that was impossible. Uh, thinking she's been... Because Nynaeve's going to recognize this. in her pos Again, in her position of power, she's had to deal with the drowned trunk, who wasn't Abel Cawthon, you stupid idiots! But she's had to deal with those kinds of things as kind of the town disciplinarian. She's like the vice principal of the town. <laughs> Well, I mean, we can't say Abel Cawthon never had one too many. It never says one way or the other. You can be True. someone who has a good time and has too much to drink and still and, a and, good person. Matt. Right? And, and given how Matt acts, he, he probably did enjoy his cups in celebratory occasions. And had the... the, the the after morning head the next day and had to be dunked in water maybe on occasion or two. Yeah, but it's... was still capable of doing his job as a husband and a father. Yeah, that wasn't the part that made me mad mm -hmm. about Abel Cawthon in the show. It was that they made it, him an abusive asshole as well. Mm -hmm. Just so that they could have Matt be angsty. Matt mm -hmm. is the non-angsty character. That's kind of his point. You morons. Um... Let's see. I, I, I do like um I don't know if you have any any thoughts before then, but the uh kind of the next thing that jumps out at me that I really like is is middle of four sixty six, um, where they're talking about how Queen Tylen can't do anything about Jacob Carradine because the white cloaks are powerful and she's not a very strong queen. Um I did not think her a coward, Avienda said disgustedly, and Tom gave her an amused smile. You have never faced something you could not fight, child, he said gently. Something so strong, your only choice is to flee or be consumed alive. Try to hold judgment on Tylen till you have. 
For some reason, Avienda's face reddened. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, this is this is uh, kind of a cross cultural thing because just the, the the difference between people who play games of houses and nations versus how straightforward the Aiel way of life is. Mm -hmm. You know, even as a clan chief, you don't play those games because you either have blood feud or you don't, or you have, you know, these water truces. And those are the, that's, that's as deep as the politics gets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, did you have any more thoughts on this before we just get to the, um, Elaine getting her head dunked in water? Uh, they made a comment when Brigitte gets back in there. That I, I liked, but when yeah, she comes back in and starts giving her review, mm -hmm. and uh, there's in in within that uh, review, uh, he br she brings up Besslin was there and he how much he can drink, and well, but before we get to that, there is this this brief little where Elaine is so she's gone beyond tipsy and she's uh, incoherently drunk enough to accidentally spill the beans and reveal to the guys how they've been sneaking out by showing them the disguise oh, yeah. <laughs> weave. And it's such a, it, it's a little thing. And again, the reason RJ's writing is so good is because it's so often doing two or even three or four things. And you get this, this great, you know, moment of hilarity of naive um, freaking out because Elaine cast the, the mirror of mist on her on an, on naive in in a a scandalous way um you know it is 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 it, yeah the sea folk so she turns nine she makes nynaeve look like a sea folk woman who when they are out at sea are bare chested because shirts just get in the way it's not actually nynaeve but she's freaking out and yelling at the guys to avert their eyes you know it it would be like a a so someone, uh, a woman having a scantily clad avatar in a video game and getting mad that people are looking at it. It's it's not actually you, but that's just how prudish she is. Well, it, yes, there is the extra element of uh, it being on her, but she mm -hmm. would she has yelled at the men for looking at the seafolk. Period. So well, that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, of of. There's an there. There's already that. Hey, stop looking at this naked woman, even if it's not real. But the the emotional overreaction, I think, is because it's her, even though it's not her. But it doesn't matter because she's just that prudish, um, which, which makes some some later scenes extra fun. Uh, I I, I do like Birgit's entrance of just stumbling in the door and upending a. Up bowl of water on her head so, okay so she starts giving her story mm -hmm. and but it, it opens with Besslin being there and uh, of course Birgitte has to point out that the boy is the same age as them so we, we get an age for him he's so around Ta 18 Ta yeah. Tom ta tells her uh, that because they're the girls, of course, are worried that Matt is going to corrupt Besslin. And Birgit says, Yeah, he's already pretty well corrupted. Mm -hmm. and, and then Tom says, The boy is the same age as you, Tom told her in stuffy tones. Um, a baffled look passed between Nynaeve and Elaine. What was his point? Everybody knew that a man did not achieve his proper wits, such as they were, until 10 years later than a woman. And that's that's the that's the quote I wrote down in my notes because this is this is one of those things where there's a biological truth, but women so exaggerated in their heads mm -hmm. that they become extremely annoying about it. You know, twenty two year old woman will, wants to be treated like an adult so bad that she she if you if you even bring up the word experience, you are going to get harangued by this you know eighteen to twenty twenty two year old woman. Uh, I have yes, a story about that do... that I probably shouldn't tell because it is, is, is too personal. I'll tell you off air <laughs> <laughs> about about someone uh, about someone haranguing uh, boys older than her um, about about becoming young men and and yeah, just yeah. 
it, 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 and, and to the point, yes, there is an element of truth to that. They do oh, development I... a year or two earlier than boys. They go through puberty puberty first. Their prefrontal cortex develops a little earlier. But the, the again, the, the difference there and the reason it's 10 years later than a woman is because what they're talking about, I think, is that it takes about five to 10 years extra of world experience for a male to figure out what's going on with girls because they're so bizarre. So it, it's not that they, you know, they have their wits. It's that they have figured out enough how women act and think to be able to work with them and around them more ably. Well, let's go back to the evolutionary lens, though, and I'm going to give an alternate hypothesis. It takes about five to ten years more then the age says for men to develop the resources to be attractive to women. Mm. And now I just all of a sudden start ignoring the things I don't like about the man because he is a good mate partner and the man values youth and beauty. is going to say, Oh, look, a very good mate for me. And all of a sudden they get along and they feel like they have so much in common. It's do you, did you get um, Weinstein and Hayes? latest but what is it a hunter gatherer's guide to mm -hmm. living in the modern world or something like that right there yeah so the uh the hunter gatherer's guide to the modern world part of that would be the the elementary or sometimes even into middle school age boy who who, who kind of gets that hey that there's something about that girl that I like not fully grasping what all that means, what all that is. And so you pull her pigtails is the classic trope because that's how you get her attention. Because if you were a boy and I wanted to get your attention, you know, I, I'd, I'd give you a shove or, you know, slug you on the shoulder and laugh at you for something. This is me getting your attention. It takes a little while to understand, oh, that's not how girls want you to get their attention. And so then you get into high school and it's, hey, want to come ride in my new car? Mm -hmm. Because, oh, flashy resources. Hey, well, this and this, is, this nice. is something Peterson talks about at length when he does his uh, cognitive behavioral psychology stuff versus the stuff he does now. He is. Young women are after the resources and after what would make a good partner for a long-term relationship to have children, which you need investment because you're going to be helpless for a little while while you mm -hmm. are pregnant and, you know, less so in modern times, but we're talking again, we've got 2 million years, you know, the last 10,000 being very influential of of this happening we're not going to write the ship in in 50 years well, of having and, and a point you made last time i think on tuesday you made this when we were talking about it is it, it's not that you're uh you know we aren't I, I i may have brought up genesis tuesday or when we were talking and there are you know some stories there about how this actually worked and it is how big is your sheep herd mm-hmm you know, do, do you have your own tent? Do you have your own camels? Do you, it's not that it's, anymore. It's a little more but... subtle than that. I don't want to make this an argument of you have money and a, you know, a great job, then you're going to attract all the women because they also, they're, they're looking for the markers of someone exactly. who will be competent. It, Broad it, shoulders, intelligence, generosity, kindness. Do you tip well? Are yeah. you, are you polite to strangers to other people mm -hmm. it's it's all these cues that a woman is going to see when she's with you and it is going to point to those those things the idea of resources which means you're an established person you have a you have a job or if you don't have a job because you're still young you have a goal that you're working towards so that you're you're not just a couch potato in your mom's basement eating cheetos and drinking mountain well, Dew. To, to bring it back to the book for from peterson's uh lectures and takes is young women and this is the developmental part she's talking about men develop later well guess what young men women elaine's age and even still nynaeve's age 
have trouble differentiating between narcissism and competence. So that's a good point. And at that point, they're going to fall for the narcissist so much that they're going to think men that age don't have any wits or are just in it for the sex or are self-centered or all of these tropes that come out of man. That I, that is something I had not thought of before, but it makes a ton of sense. So when Baloo was talking about how he asked someone who was good with the ladies, Hey, how do I get laid? And the guy flippantly said, be an asshole. And to him, whether the guy meant it or not, because as he was saying, he was watching this guy, but you're not an asshole. If by asshole, you mean jerk. What he was, was unapologetically, unapologetically himself right. and willing to cut the cord if things weren't going well. So yeah. he's not going to be the, the other end of the spectrum would be a simp. He's not going to be following this girl around like a, a lost puppy dog it's or or oh, giving insincere compliments or you yeah you you didn't like the compliment i gave you or the way i phrased it that's a that's a you problem you don't yeah. want to do this thing that i want to do okay see you next time i'm I'm gonna go do this thing because this is my thing as my friend jc would say he, he he'd say email me but <laughs> and you just walk away what, the point you just made is a really good one it's it's a big part of where the asshole trope comes from because eventually it gets to that point and and that's where older more established males are good with the ladies but in your youth if you're not good with the ladies like us and you're in high school those guys were assholes those guys were jerks but the girl was too immature to see that because she she did not have the world experience to differentiate between what was it you you put the difference between narcissism narcissism and competence, and competence yeah yeah at, at an older age because you've had time to gather this you have the 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 actual physical markers to back up the potential markers that you had that narcissist has that narcissist has all the potential in the world they just are so self-centered. They never do it in the in the uh, pursuit of having a family or or actually caring about anybody right. but themselves. So Matt won't corrupt corrupt Beslin. Bergie said dryly as the door closed behind the man. I doubt nine feather dancers with a shipload of brandy could corrupt him. <laughs> they wouldn't know where to begin. I love that. All right. So they kick the guys out so they can talk. Uh, where, where did you want, was there anything else you wanted to go here? Cause to me, the next great big thing is Birgit pointing the finger at Elaine and Nynaeve and saying, y'all sold me a bill of goods. That's not who Matt is. That's not what he wants. That's not what he's thinking. You're the ones who are actually in the wrong here. Yeah. Yeah, my, and, my, my next note was the very end of the chapter, so you can yeah. go into this. And yeah. and I, I think kind of the undertone here of how Birgit explains um, how Birgit explains how Matt related all this. He wasn't uh he wasn't even being accusatory. He was just being annoyed. You know, you can kind of see him rolling his eyes as he takes a drink. Oh, and another thing those silly girls did. It's not like he's telling her this because he wants Bergie to go read them the riot act. And, 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 you know, he doesn't say, go tell those girls they should apologize to me. He's just ranting to a chum because that's what mm -hmm. she has become that quickly. She, he's just letting off steam with a drinking buddy. She's the one who comes in and says, you two need to make this right. Because as she puts it, uh, going into the dungeons of... And, <laughs> and he left out the part where one of the Forsaken was in charge of the stone. In Nynaeve's reaction, that despicable, despicable man. <laughs> this is this is this is the 
okay, if there is a female in the audience, if you haven't run away yet, don't attach intent to what we do. Mm -hmm. We probably didn't intend what you thought we intended. Yeah. The fact that he left out that a Forsaken was in charge of the stone, I think that makes it pretty clear that he was just venting to a drinking buddy. He wasn't trying to lay out all the sins of the girls so that Brigitte could go and tell them what for. And that makes Brigitte even more adamant, oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even know that part. It was already yeah. bad enough, but I and don't what... know that I would have done that for Geidel, who is literally her soulmate. No, she said anyone short of Geidel. So she anyone implies, that, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. she would have. But uh, the, 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 the things he didn't mention, probably out of humility, she attaches the word despicable to. Yes. So it's this is this is the frust one of the frustrations with men is because sometimes you can't win for losing. You try to do something a certain way to do the right thing, but then when it, intent is attached to it that never existed, you f you flip it on its head, and now you're angry with me over something that I was actually I maybe thought you would get angry with me if I was to be grandiose about it. And that 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 really gets. <laughs> that that really gets laid out in the next chapter when they actually go to Matt. But finishing up this chapter, uh, it is both a a uh, a character flaw and a character um, positive how Elaine acts here. I think because she isn't necessarily doing the right thing because it's the right thing. She's doing it because she wants. Avienda to be proud of her, which is something of a flaw because she should be able to recognize, yeah, we did Matt wrong here. She should she should be able to better understand where Birgit is coming from. And she's really more in Nynaeve's camp. She's just not as hysterical about it because she has, you know, she has this other it would be like if Nynaeve had Lan in the room. Is is that Nynaeve would not be be behaving this way if Lan was in the room? I think we can safely say. Mm -hmm. And for Elaine, that's Avienda, because now, even though she doesn't have that, I'm going to sexual go... attraction. She does have that familial attraction. Well, I'm going to go further into that because she has some internal self talk in the next chapter that I think actually adds a layer to that. Mm. So, all right. Well, let's t uh, take a short break because I need a refill and I need to empty what I've already drinking. All right, drinking. All right. All right. That, so that chapter finishes out. One, one thing I wrote down. Oh yeah. It it just made me giggle uh, because I don't know what was on my mind, but the uh, second to last paragraph there. Are you listening to me? Nynaeve demanded. I said I will not apologize. I don't know why it popped in my head, but Nynaeve's having a Sam Harris moment there. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, but also sad. But uh, just real quickly, pointing that out is I, to me, this feels a little bit of uh, uh, reinforcing my thoughts on the Nynaeve Birgit parallel there because they went right on talking. Only Birgit looked at her, and the woman wore a smile not far from outright laughter. Because they're both so masculine, and, and we saw this back in Fires of Heaven when, because what's kind of the, the polar opposite of the ultra-masculine, it's the simp. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what Nynaeve was being when Birgit first got pulled into the real world, mm -hmm. because she felt so guilty. And Birgit told her, I can't like this Nynaeve. I like you. I mean, and, and think about what that means, this genuine legend telling you. I like you. I think we could be friends. I want to be your friend, but this isn't you. This isn't the naive that I was friends with. Well, you and yeah, I, I forgot about that dynamic. And and now you have naive realistically standing her ground again, probably for the first real time with Birgit. But I think, I think the smile here and why the other girls are just ignoring her is because Birgit gets it. I think mm -hmm. she understands exactly where Nynaeve is coming from. But she also knows 
that she was completely wrong in her thinking. You're completely (laughs) wrong. Yeah. You know, you're going to do it. And I'm going to laugh like hell. It's because she's masculine in a different way. This is very much a guy reaction. But ending with that statement from Nynaeve, I think lends weight to what I'm about to talk about in the next chapter. And, And now you had a very interesting thought that I hadn't considered before about kind of the symbolism of this chapter as far as Nynaeve goes. Yeah, so we we start the chapter, Elaine is, we're we're in Elaine's perspective now, which is, I I think, good, because for for this part of the conversation, because we just, uh, we just got Nynaeve's perspective. She's stubborn as hell, but then we're going to see things from her that it would, I think it would not be good to see her internal thoughts it, on that. And, and because, my, because this is a, so just a step back just a little bit. We talk about Jordan showing, not telling. We just got the gist of Brigitte's Brigitte, Br- and uh, Matt's conversation without ever hearing the conversation. We got some important points from what she told them, but we could fill in the blanks with everything else. And it was what was not said that made it actually fun. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And from her perspective, we got plenty of Nynaeve's perspective, to your point, of what she thinks about what's about to happen here at the beginning of chapter 22. I, it, it's more useful. It's it's It grows the story better to now change it to Elaine's perspective. And we still see what Nynaeve is saying. We don't need to see what she's thinking. What 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 is is richer as far as the story goes is to have Nynaeve ranting about how this is a bad idea we shouldn't do this we don't need to do this and the the thing that is is the most telling to me and she doesn't just say this here this sentiment is expressed by Nynaeve elsewhere that Matt's going to make our lives the pit of doom so that is a very confrontational mindset that I can't give ground. It's also kind of masculine too of I can't give ground to this person or they're going to make my life a living hell. Right? Mm -hmm. That we have established a hierarchy. So now I can't give ground to you because then I threaten the position that I've established. But it's also a very negative view of Matt. You know, that, okay, maybe maybe he'll laugh a little bit. Maybe he'll make fun of you a little bit. He is a he has demonstrated that he is a very altruistic individual, even if 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 you're if you're kind of of Nynaeve's personality, you could think he's a jerk or he's annoying. Maybe not a jerk, but okay, he that's annoying when he does stuff like that because Nynaeve doesn't have that kind of sense of humor or whatever. But he's demonstrated that he's also very altruistic yeah, multiple but, times but you you also pointed out because of their history you know, there's the bias in the model her model of matt is mm-hmm. not only him as an adolescent when she became village wisdom but she's on the tail end of all the mischief she's not on the tail end of the good stuff he wasn't working for her bringing yeah. her herbs or doing stuff like that he was out putting flour on badgers and she was she was the one that uh had that to clean it up had to clean it up and switch yeah. his bottom right so she's mm-hmm. only getting negative matt for the majority of their interaction and and then there's little tidbits here and there in their interactions that reinforce that him dawdling serving girls and the uh, things across those lines but the altruistic part she doesn't pay attention to or she actually wasn't exposed to a lot of it Here's an interesting thought that leads right into what you were going to talk about, about, about Nynaeve's doing this. This is a very Matt, it's very different, but it's also a very Matt way of doing things. Think back to the end of the Dragon Reborn. And she did see this, where the girls are going off and he's yelling at them. Don't look to me to pull your bacon out of the fire, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then he looks at Julian and says, well, you're coming or not, and goes chasing after them. That's exactly what Nynaeve's doing right here, 
is she is ranting and complaining the whole way, but she's still following Elaine. She's still going to do it, which 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 is a shift in her character. She she started off where she was the boss, and she was if she said a thing or she was going to do a thing, by golly, it was going to be this way. This is a little bit of a shift for her. This is character growth. Well, you know what is funny? Because we always talk about the Rand Egwene parallel. And th- the more you talk there, the more I'm starting to see there's a there's a Matt Nynaeve parallel. Mm-hmm. Mm. A Nynaeve, because she's so powerful, becomes a leader amongst the Aes Sedai. When she started off literally hating the Aes Sedai, the only reason she wanted to train her power was to confront Moiraine, to punish Moiraine for what she brought to Evans Field. Well, and they Nine- both come they both come across as disagreeable, but they're actually quite agreeable people. Yeah. Uh they just want they'll just vo- uh, voice their disapproval in the process. Mm-hmm. And she's so powerful in the power that uh, it, it overcomes some deficiencies of herself and he's such a good fighter that his mm-hmm. bumbling into danger all the time he he keeps able being able to get himself out of it and they both go head first into danger reluctantly or or blindly i should say blindly is the better word they they, and they will they're complain both their about own the, worst enemy to to so you know one of my favorite scenes uh sawan in uh talking to Matt in the Dragon Reborn after he's been been healed of you remind me of my uncle. Yeah, he was a layabout. He would compl- he was a complainer. He liked to have a good time. But he died because he wouldn't stop running back into a fire because there were still people left to pull out. Yeah, but the the the, the last point is they're both their own worst enemy. Mm. Matt gets in the way of being the the number one general in all of generalness because he doesn't want to be naive can't access the power because she hates that she has it. Mm-hmm. And it, it takes, it takes something extraordinary and it takes some help, some outside help for both of them to overcome that and embrace, and accept their fate, accept embrace their embrace and accept yeah. who and what they are. Yeah. And so, so this actually leads right into the point I was going to bring up in these two pages, the interaction between Elaine and Nynaeve, especially when we get to the sulking and her talking under her breath and, you know, trying to find every excuse in the world, but she's still going to do the thing. Uh This to me is a very good example of probably the first, not obvious example, because otherwise we would have picked up on it. You know, the first five times we read this book, but the first example of naive starting to surrender because it wouldn't be a surrender if she wanted to do this or if she thought this was the right idea. This is her begrudgingly doing something she doesn't want to do at the bottom of her heart, doesn't want to do and is trying to find every excuse not to. It's, it's like that getting, you know, getting ready for your workout, but your shoulders a little twingy and you, you know, your, your stomach's a little achy and you just, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're thinking about your body, trying to figure out a way not to do it. You know, it's laying in bed before you have to get up for work. You still do it, but at the same time, you're you're going, oh, blankets warm. Oh, I slept bad. Oh, my lower back hurts because I slept weird. I'm an adult, so I have SIs, sleep injuries. Uh, but but you still do it, and this is one of the first examples I think that really jumped out at me. Pause for a second. All right, sorry, there's a hiccup there as we have to splice two recordings together, but I am a great example of the stereotype that men do not multitask well because my wife was talking to me this morning about how she had a doctor's appointment this afternoon, but because we didn't explicitly bring up, so who's going to pick up the child from school, I didn't think about it until she comes in here while we're talking going, and I, and I go, What? Oh, yes, we have a child and you have to go. So 
one plus one equals two. Well, you used a key word there that actually makes me have uh, an, another similar thought that makes women mad. Women don't multi multitask well either. They just mm. think they do. Really? Yes. The the uh, I have a shopping list in my head while I'm doing this other thing while I'm doing this other thing and oh I need to get my chapstick on and oh I almost had a wreck. That's why women drive so bad. Hmm. But but yeah no multitasking is actually a futile cause for a lot of people in a lot of situations. There are times and places for it to let your mind wander, but. But regardless of sex, you usually just do everything terrible. Yeah. Or not good. Yeah. Multitasking only works if you're 100% proficient in at least one or two of the tasks you're doing. And, you know, like thinking about your day while you're in the shower. Great. Awesome. Cool. You can do that. Listening to a podcast while you're driving. That's fine because they're two separate motor skills. You know, one's not even a motor skill. Right. So, but yeah. You see, you see people get into a lot of trouble. And in fact, I had an injury in the gym once and she tripped stepping off a box while she was doing step ups. And I ran across the garage and her first words were, I was thinking of, no, she said, it's not your fault. I was thinking about my grocery list. That's why I keep using the example of grocery list. You have to be present in most tasks you do, uh, which is a lesson for you. Stop what you're doing when your wife is telling you the thing and, uh, and think it through Yeah, and think pay, it through. Yeah. Pay attention to that thing. And you will thus give thought to that thing yeah. rather and, than. And I spend all day giving people instructions and the amount of times that they get the instructions right is very rare throughout the day. And it's just a couple things, a set of squats, eight reps, pull apart, 12, this stretch. What was, what, how many, how many of this again? I just gave you three things. It's not that complicated. Are you hearing me or are you listening to me? Mm. If you're not listening, you're multitasking. You're doing something else. Speaking of hearing and listening. Yeah. So they're not really on? listening to Matt here. Cause yeah. So, so I, I did have a remind me when we get to the end of this chapter, I did have a thought when you talked about how this is an interesting demonstration of how Nynaeve is starting to learn how to surrender because she doesn't like it, but she's, and she's complaining the whole way over to the inn, uh, even when they meet uh, uh, the serving girl. <laughs> you mark me, Elaine. He, he pushed his advances on that girl. It is literally the exact opposite. It's he wasn't attentive enough because he didn't understand that, oh, this girl wants all my attention and I just want friendly flirtation and a little time. And and it's it's literally the exact opposite. And and the serving girl is mad because you two sent Bergie over the night before. So it's actually your fault that she's talking bad about Matt. But It is therefore not surprising that even though she's doing it, she still is who she is. So there is there's character growth there because she's she's doing it, even though it's awful from her perspective and she doesn't want to, but she's still doing it. Um, but she's still who she is. That's what makes the scene work so well because there's a step. It's not a complete change, though. So she's still annoyed. At Matt's behavior, at the fact that he is super hungover, at the fact that he brushes off the saving them in the stone. Well, but then we also have a perception issue, too, because after, you know, uh, in the middle of it, Elaine quivered nothing. The man demanded an apology. I went back to where the apology actually came up. There was no demand there. Exactly. It, it, Brigitte just basically says, you know, he he wants an apology and a thanks. That's all he, you know, that's really all he wants out of this whole thing. And, and, and that is That's more, not a demand. That 
and that really is probably becoming because we didn't see the conversation, which is part of the fun. But I, if it came up, I'm quite certain Matt did not phrase it uh, as "I demand an apology." Is it was probably more along the lines of "Geez, would it be too much to ask just for a simple thank you?" No, and no. It actually we we get an insight of to what was said because uh, Nynaeve says. If you if he expects us to come on his hands and his and, and knees, and Brigitte cuts her off and says, "Well, I talked him out of that." I don't really think he was serious, anyways. But he all he really wants is an apology and a thanks. So that's she, a good point. She, she addresses that. She's like, "Yeah, you know, he joked about something serious, but really, all he wanted." And she put the the, the nicest possible way of doing it. I I I think that lends support to my idea that all he was doing there was ranting with a new drinking buddy mm -hmm. because he was being hyperbolic because he has to know there is no way in heck that those girls would ever do anything remotely like that and from what we've seen of his character again i go back to him jumping off his horse and giving a, a flourish of a bow and dropping to a knee for Egwene and glaring at all his men until they did the same. He wouldn't ask it of them. Especially, especially maybe, maybe he would tease them about it in private, but especially if it would undercut them in public. Because he can grumble all he wants, but he is... He is a public figure. And besides personally knowing how that works, he's smart enough and intuitive enough in social cues to recognize that kind of stuff. So he would not undercut them in public. I think he was being hyperbolic there, but Birgit is savvy enough, both in general and with men in particular, to understand that yeah, he's being hyperbolic here, but there's a there's a strong element of truth to this. He really it does feel hurt, even if he wouldn't vocalize it to Nine Even Elaine directly. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna do it for him because I'm his new pal. The more I think about it, the the more perfect this this whole scene is as far as yeah, male so, female dynamic yeah we're not going to get far today just because of how awesome this this little spot was but because you've got you've got Nynaeve and elaine versus matt and then you've got Birgit in the middle and it's not that she is a manly woman she is a masculine woman she's still very much a woman that's why I think it's important that she puts on the feathers and says, hey, it's nice to be looked at sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because she's still very much a woman. She just understands the male mind much better than most other women. So so she can kind of she can kind of be the go-between, the you know, in, in a lot of stories, especially a fantasy or science fiction story uh the the trick of the author is to have an every man and and in the beginning it's rand because he comes from such a podunk out of the way place that stuff has to be explained to him a lot during the eye of the world all of the characters that way because the author needs to explain to us the reader who also doesn't know about this world and that's kind of Bergie in this situation is she's kind of the the go between between these two very different worlds. Um, I do think this is the more I think about it, the more this scene kind of makes me. I already kind of didn't like Elaine a ton, especially amongst the more main characters. But this scene just reinforces that that, like I said about the last chapter, she's not doing this because it's the right thing to do. She's doing it. Because she wants Avienda to be proud of her. She wants she wants to be the kind of person that Avienda could take as a first sister instead of just a near sister. Um, 
Well, and except that's... this is where I had a, a, another layer to go on that. Mm. Uh, if you're already there on 480, where she's got the internal self-talk about she's doing this. And it's not, uh, you know, I wanted Avienda's respect. If I'm going to, uh, not only the intention to become a sis sister wife, that very idea was indecent. So she's fighting her mind right here. Uh, but she did like her. And it was not Avienda's fault that Rand caught both their hearts and men's as well. It's not about her relationship with Avienda. She's telling herself it's about her relationship with Avienda. It's about her relationship with Rand. She doesn't want to do this thing. But she also knows deep down inside that creating a conflict between Avienda and Min to be the one that ends up with Rand has a two-thirds chance of not coming out in her favor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, knowing Rand as a stubborn mule that he is it's probably going to be the shooting yourself in the foot if you take that route also remember back to the last book the end of the last book she took elaine took on this task because it was important to civilize matt before sending him back to rand mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's really not about her and Avienda. Now, it is in this situation, but the underlying thing, she would she would uh, cut Avienda out in a heartbeat if she thought she was going to come out on top of that tryst. Now, later, I would disagree. Right now, no, for right, sure. Right now. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, she, she still even had the moment of grabbing the knife earlier. We're not far removed from that. That's a very good point. Now, they, they go through some stuff in this book, and especially in the next book, mm -hmm. that changes that. But right now, you are absolutely right. And uh, and to that point... And it's not just her own internal thoughts that she's fighting with. She's also fighting with culture, because she grew up in a culture where that's not cool. She also grew up in a culture, to that point, where I'm, I'm looking here, where, where you pointed out 480 in the middle. She swears by the Lion Throne of Andor... Matt is a subject of hers, technically, as far as Matt would say, but that doesn't mean anything to Elaine. No, Matt is her subject. She is the daughter heir of Andor, and Matt is an Andoran. <laughs> and he, after her swearing on the Lion Throne, which, you know... You're 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 a devout Christian, and someone swears on the Bible is what that is supposed to be from Elaine's perspective. Mm -hmm. And his head swiveled toward them ever so slowly, and he lowered the cloth just enough to expose one red streaked eye. You sound like you have an iron rod down your throat, my lady," he said mockingly. What she did that this is Jordan telling us the lie of the perspective. This, this is one of the great things about his style is the unreliable narrator. His, his narrators are mostly reliable in that they are relaying to you the, the accurate facts of the scene. But the interpretation and the analysis of the scene is wholly unreliable because it's based on that person's biases and... Elaine is being proper and she is bending over backwards as far as she is concerned because here, yeah, he's a general. Yeah, he's a right-hand man to the Emperor Rand. He's still a commoner and one of my subjects. And I am figuratively crawling on my knees here even if I'm not literally doing it. But we know from everything we've seen from both perspectives, we can be quite certain Matt is absolutely right here. That that is her tone. That this she is going through the motions and she only kind of means it because she doesn't mean it to Matt. She means it to Rand and secondarily to Avienda, to your point. That's who she means it to. You have my permission to call me Matt. Odious man! <laughs> and 
and to me, this is this is part of the fun and and part of the development is from Elaine's perspective, she thinks she's so much better than Nynaeve because she's not vocalizing it. But she thinks every bit as much as Nynaeve is. She just has too much self-restraint to vocalize it. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you have any more thoughts about this chapter? Because my next thought is really at the end of this chapter. Uh, Well, the, the, something we touched on earlier, but we didn't say specifically, they finally tell him they're after the ball of winds. All of a sudden he sees the importance of the mission. And he, if you had just told him this from the beginning, you would have had a compliant Matt the whole time. He's going to make our lives the pit of doom. We think we can change the weather. Holy crap, that's a big effing deal. Yeah, of course <laughs> Matt's going to think that. He may think differently than you, but he's well, not I mean, one yeah, of the forsaken. In the way he does right here, you need this many guards, you need this, because it's that dangerous over there. Mm-hmm. That, I am going to I am going to do what I think I need to do to maximize your uh chances of fulfilling this mission because it is a big effing deal. He this is why I referenced his conversation with Tom uh earlier is that he he didn't completely understand what Tom was saying because he didn't have that same life experience. Tom's a middle-aged man. He's probably actually just on the other side of middle-aged. He's been around the block a few times and then some. But Matt is savvy enough to get what Tom was trying to say, even if he grumbles about it and tells Tom he's a dingleberry. Mm -hmm. But he can't do that. He can't actually follow that advice if they don't tell him what the heck they're doing. He can follow that advice with Egwene because... Egwene doesn't have to tell him what she's doing. He can just look and see, holy crap, Egwene, this girl who I treated as kind of like a younger cousin or whatever, because we grew up so close, she is now the most powerful position, even if she's not the most powerful person, she's the most powerful position in the known world, but she's not being treated that way. I'm going to drop down on a knee to help her out. He doesn't have to be told what Egwene is trying to do. He can see it. The mission of Nynaeve and Elaine is so specific, there's no way he could infer it. Mm-hmm. Because it's way outside of his wheelhouse. It's it's objects of the power. How could he possibly know that's what they were doing? And as he thinks earlier, when he's trying to figure out where the heck they've gone is... There's no way they would go to the Rahad because it's, 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 I mean, it's the kind of place he wouldn't want to go. He would go, but he wouldn't really want to because it's so rough and tumble. But now that he knows, to your point, it's all right, here's uber masculine Matt, general Matt going, all right, this is the objective. So now, you know, Let me start laying out the points on how we get there. I do like the internal uh, dialogue. Uh, She she admits to herself her own her knowledge of men was limited to Rand and what Linny and her mother had told her. There there you go. There's there therein lies the problem. And Linny was all kind of lay back and think of England kind of things. It was all kind of aphorisms and wives tales whereas her mom would have told her probably a little bit more than a normal mother to daughter in this kind of setting relationship but it all would have been focused on duty because remember Morgase herself did that she married the previous queen's husband to solidify her position and help bring about stability and continuation of the line. She did not marry for love at all. 
she married because she was queen and this was the right thing to do. And she had baby making time to make babies. And then that was that. So Elaine definitely has a pretty warped sense of men and women. All right. Uh, my Thank last thoughts on that chapter were, oh, yeah, you're, you're jumping to the end, right? Yep. Okay, go ahead. So two things, as always, at least minimum two things. I love this scene because we've he, Jordan has already established that Mistress Anon is more than she seems and she's someone to be reckoned with. Because of that setup, we now get a great payoff here with her interaction between Nynaeve and Elaine. And it's amusing to us, the reader, because she's so kind of what we were talking about before about how asshole doesn't mean jerk it means supremely self-confident and that's what mistress anon is is she's not being a jerk per se here it might seem like that way from elaine and nine's perspective because by golly we really are aes Sedai, as elaine says well, and this is this is where the women should understand the men remember the the statement earlier the uh innocent indignation or what was the term uh outraged innocence mm. <laughs> being accused of something you didn't do well they have the same feeling because That's they're not getting point. the respect that they think they deserve That's a good point. but it's based on someone's perception of them just like her perception of Jylan at the moment was that fox in the in the hen yard <laughs> It's the but, same feeling, different reasons that bubble it up. I, I like, I hadn't really thought about it in these terms, but the end of this chapter is just reinforcing what Elaine has been going through and thinking this whole time of suffering, suffering through all this because it needs to be done. Originally for Rand and Avienda. And now she's going to suffer some more because, fine, Nynaeve is not only a friend and a, and a companion in battle, but she's also technically my superior when it comes to Aes Sedai mm -hmm. So I'm going to go along with it, but I'm going to sigh and I'm going to roll my eyes because this is silly. Now, my important note on this was... This is this is a this is the bigger moment of the two in this chapter where Nynaeve surrenders. See, I disagree. To me, the end of this chapter, because I hadn't thought about it until you pointed it out at the beginning of this chapter, is this is Nynaeve learning how to surrender. But the end of this chapter, and not just the end of this chapter, but the next couple of chapters, she's desperate we see pure desperation here she's clinging at straw she's you know asmodeen's story in fires of heaven about the guy literally grabbing holding to tufts of grass trying to hold on from falling off a cliff mm -hmm. that's not even this because she she was learning how to surrender at the beginning of the chapter and now she sees a way out because she tells Elaine, that's what this is about. We don't need Matt if we can find this because a circle means more than just a few. This is an organization. Yeah, but, but my point is she surrendered to Mistress Anon. That's to, a good point. To get the power she thinks she to can get, get from what yeah. That's a good point. To get what she wanted, but she hasn't completely learned yet because she she jumped to that surrender because she was trying to get away from Matt. Because inside her, we can imagine inside her head, she was probably feeling the same way Elaine was at the treatment from Mr. Sanon. But she Not realized, she realized I have to give in to this to get to the other side of the you know, thing. Nynaeve is even more prickly than Elaine when it comes to her status as Aes Sedai. Mm -hmm. Elaine always has the fallback of I'm the daughter of Andor. Nynaeve doesn't have that. 
So Nynaeve is even more prickly about their status as Aes Sedai than Elaine is. So that's a good point. So did you have any thoughts on the kin in general? Because to me, with, with what you've been talking about here is... To, that that is the big picture to me of these next couple of chapters their interaction with the kin of this is Nynaeve still trying to learn how to surrender because she can't fully surrender because she doesn't want to I mean the whole reason she's here in front of the kin is to try and not surrender to Matt Elaine is only going to put up with so much. And then it's, all right, that's it. I've had enough. I'm going to put my ring back on. I'm a lot. Uh, Elaine Sedai. I, I Sedai of the Green Hajar, daughter heir of Andor. And I'm leaving now. Because I've had enough of this. And Nynaeve has to... <laughs> I mean, Elaine has to kind of, at the end act almost childlike in Nynaeve because Nynaeve doesn't want to admit it. She doesn't want to go through with it because she can convince herself that surrendering to the kin is much more agreeable than surrendering to Matt, who is an odious man, as Elaine thought. So these next three chapters are them dealing with the kin. So chapter 23, 24, 25 is them dealing with the kin. Mm, 25 is a per second oh, no, chapter. Never mind. 25 is a per second chapter. I, I messed up. Yeah. Uh, what I forgot, and I didn't read this far ahead in prep. How did they get out of there? Because I know they were shielded by that one that had the talent for they, shielding. They were let go as, as they... they think and say later it they don't force people you know they don't believe them at all that those are actually that they're really Aes Sedai but part of their order part of their creed they don't force they help they allow you know people put out of the tower to join them but they don't take in wilders that's a big part of their rule um they only take in people who had been part of the tower at one point, and they don't force them. So when when Elaine makes it clear, we're leaving, Rianne kind of tells them, all right, hey, and she has to kind of chastise one of them that we don't force people. Let them go. So off you go. Um, and there there is a comment there about they'll, they'll like pass on rumor to – so that it will end up in uh, the palace to let the real Aes Sedai know that these these pretenders are out there so that if, if you're not going to join us, then we're going to let the Aes Sedai know that you're here and they're going to deal with you. Because they... There's a quasi-pretender syndrome that goes on with the kin, which is interesting, where... They revere the White Tower, and they try to um, make themselves feel at least part of it, even though they know they're not fully of the Tower. That's why they have rules. They're not just a loose association, like they try and say, um to to play off that there's an organization here but they are organized they have they're organized they have rules they have a home base the farm rest to the tower um they have a hierarchy they have uh, uh, a government they have all these things because they are all people who desperately wanted to be part of this bigger greater, thing and couldn't and then ultimately couldn't let it go at the, uh, end, of, at the end of that chapter they get mugged I'm trying to catch my mind up to that
Yeah. So uh, Elaine gets clunked in the head. Mm -hmm. And then someone is tr trying to help, and they're not sure that it's not part of the issue. Um, yeah, because that's what I was seeing where when Nynaeve went dizzy, did she drink the drink before? No, she got clunked. She was the one that got clunked in the head, maybe. No, well, Elaine, she she heals Elaine. Mm -hmm. This this uh, shopkeeper woman is offering her a drink, and Nynaeve is suspicious. She thinks mm -hmm. she might be part of it. And we're left a little ambiguous of, was that just a good Samaritan who Nynaeve didn't trust, or was that part of it too? Um, But that is not part of old Coley. I think we're pretty sure that that is part of um crap, I can't remember who it was. The the Black Aja that are in town. Mm. And and cuz that's we well, saw especially them since a we get them ago. in a chapter right yep, right following it, you know. Yeah, and they're thinking that it's Teslin and Jolene trying to grab them for the White Tower for Elida. Um, I, I, if you don't have any other thoughts, I do like how this ends as far as Nynaeve and Elaine and their personalities and the exchange with Matt here of, uh, Nynaeve nodded slowly, though she would rather have eaten a handful of dirt. Today it seemed so bright for a time, but then it had spiraled into darkness from Rianne to, oh, light. How long before she had her hair? Had to she had her gray hair. Don't cry, Nynaeve. Matt can't possibly be that bad. He'll find it for us in a few days, I know. Nynaeve only cried harder. Because as much as she wants out of this situation, having to admit that Matt was the key to finding the bull would make it worse. Well, not only that, there's. it's not just about finding the bull. This was a, a testament moment to the fact that bodyguards would be nice. That's a good point, that he's doubly right. They they were just shown directly, physically. They, they felt the pain of how Matt was right. And now Elaine just inadvertently pointed out once again, oh yeah, Matt was right. We should have had Matt in on this for the whole time because the bull of the winds is that important. We shouldn't have been shoving him to the side. And Nynaeve can't stomach that because she still hasn't learned to completely surrender. <laughs> nope. Uh, if we want to get into spoilers and comments, yes, I, I have a spoiler around what you said about uh, Nynaeve and the surrendering. All right. If you are reading this for the first time, go away because you really shouldn't. You don't want spoilers. The whole point of this is the the depth of it all so you can think and be wrong and be accidentally right sometimes and it makes it makes for the the whole experience much more fun so go away all right so spoilers uh what well, you said nine even desperation when she finally embraces the source it's desperation that gets Complete her there desperation yeah, yeah. That's so it, it, this whole chapter parallels what happens here in a little bit that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, that's the only spoilery thing I have, uh, realistically. I, I didn't think of anything else that, that popped up. So just a couple of comments here. What have we got? Uh well, we're gonna do we're gonna read the new spring again when it when it's time. Isn't it after this book? Yes, because that was one of the things that made Path of Daggers take so long. And I remember you and all the other nerds uh, in the dorm complaining about how long it had taken for Path of Daggers. And of course, I'm going, what are y'all talking about? I haven't even heard of this series yet. Um, but it, it had taken like an extra year more than usual to get Path of Daggers out. Uh, and that was it was partly because of the Big White Book and partly because of New Spring. Now, this other one, this is what I you, you might know better than I. Um, because I can't remember the incidents he's talking about. When they got off the boat, she she used bail fire where, there, where for, the girls were captured. 
When when were they mm-hmm. captured getting off a boat? Okay, so first, Moraine. She hints when she kills the Dark Hounds that she had spent some time learning things, ferreting out things that you weren't supposed to know. So mm-hmm. she had somehow figured out through study how to do Balefire. I had forgotten about this, and there is some debate in the forums, or at least there were back when I was paying attention to those things, that when they got off the boat in the Dragon Reborn and the Aiel come and save them, when they burst out of oh, that scene. Okay. where they're imprisoned, the girls all do something. And one of them, I can't remember if it's Egwene or Elaine, makes fire burst out of the Madral. And the other one goes, oh, and and wraps them in air to squeeze them together so that because the aisle are flinching from the fire because it's so hot. And then Nynaeve says something and holds out her hand and a white hot bar of fire shoots out and they disappear i had forgotten about that and like i said there there are some who think who aren't sure or who don't think that that was balefire but i think that was probably balefire so that's a good point let me pause and get the that the how it's exactly described and we'll that's a good idea spend a couple seconds on that all right so we found it if you're in the hardcover it's 364 I'm on page 454 of the paper back here. And a thin bar of white light that made noonday sun seem dark, a bar of fire that made molten metal seem cold, connecting her hands to the Merdral, and they ceased to exist as if they had never been. Nynaeve gave a startled jump, and then the glow around her vanished. Yeah. What was that? And later, it, a couple of sentences later, bale fire is the first thing in Egwene's thoughts. Mm-hmm. She did and not I know did not how see... she knew, but she was certain of it. And I did not see a thing of what she did. Holy crap, that's a big that's a big big setup. Jeez, I've never seen that before. Aguain instinctively knowing that that was Balefire. And she's the one who figures out how to make the counter Balefire. That's interesting. I got to think that is a purposeful setup. Big time setup. When we're... But the, the to, to Scott's point that we talked a little bit about last time of how in the world did I need to figure this out? Egwene didn't see anything. And I believe this is, this chapter is from Egwene's perspective, but we know that, I think I mentioned this last time. Balefire is an incredibly complex weave involving all the five powers. And we saw just a little bit earlier in the girl's storyline that Nynaeve's healing weaves are incredibly complex because one of them is looking over her shoulder and comments on that when she's healing the the spear maiden. Mm-hmm. Who, well, even who in the chapter we were just at, she does a simple weave because she's dizzy. Uh, but she mentions in her head that normally she would do a much more complex weave. And we get an exasperated Elaine, a worn out Elaine, when normally with her healing, they're not worn out, like mm. we had talked about before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So her, she, she already knows how to do incredibly complex weaves instinctively. And then. What it says, what Nynaeve answers when Elaine says, what was that? Her uh, Nynaeve's response is, I don't know. I I was so angry, so afraid at what they wanted to. I do not know what it was. She was so angry. That's how she does what she does when she heals. Mm-hmm. So it was just a, it was an evolution of what she had already established, which was, she got so angry at death that she was able to make incredibly complex healing weaves. Well, she got so angry at the very nature of these things, the murderall and the the death and destruction that they represented, that she unleashed 
an incredibly complex weave on them. But I, I had forgotten that, yeah, that was, we did see her do it before, b before the, the Terangriel rod that the Black Ajah uses to try and kill her when she's fighting with Mulgideon. And that's where it was. Good, good catch, Scott, because I had forgotten about that. I, I had a suspicion that there was something else, but I, I had not remembered that scene. Uh, the only thing about that scene that bothers me now is weren't there Aiel dead from the Merdral? And they're still dead. Yes, because one of them mentioned specifically It was the one that they had just healed. That they had just healed, and it makes Nynaeve really mad. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so with the consistency with Balefire, I mean, that we, was... We're talking you know, seconds to a minute from when the person died. We don't know how long passed from when the fight broke out, when the Aiel burst in, and when the girls came out of the cell. We also don't get a sense of how strong it was, but it's definitely something that I seriously doubt Jordan had hard rules for, because it's a little fuzzy. And there are times like this where you go, but Shouldn't that have? And then we see when Rand and Ravine and I don't know, but yeah, it is. It, once you realize it after the fact, and you know, on a reread and go, wait a minute, now that I know what Balefire is, how come that didn't work? We just we just have to assume that the bar wasn't that thick. But we've we've seen, and he's explained where it was like a finger of Balefire before, um, because Rand does that when he first uses it on the Dark Hounds in uh, Fires of Heaven, because mm -hmm. he blasts them with something thicker, and then he think he thinks seeing what it did previously, he goes to the side and he uses a, a small, a, he points his finger, and it's a finger thick. Because he doesn't want it to go through and hit Matt. Even though he doesn't know what it is, he just knows he doesn't want it to hit Matt. Yeah, but in that scene, didn't the, the slobber that had burned Matt's skin all of a sudden not have a burn? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. So even with a finger, it was able to go back, uh, who, who knows, maybe 30 seconds to a minute? Yeah. yeah. It, it is a little bit of a hole there. Yeah, well, we're, we're picking since, nits because that's the only thing yeah. you can do with with Wheel of Time. Well, and especially since the, there were multiple fallen Aiel, it was just that one was the the, the one that they had just healed, mm -hmm. and the older man, which is that Rourke, mm -hmm. there he says, "There's no need." They took Shadow Man Steel, so it was the Merdral that killed him, yep. not not the other soldiers there. So we uh, we we get specific specificities. But then we don't get that one thing that Balefire does in that in that situation, and it, 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 the way it's written, it's not a long battle. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, any other thoughts? Because we didn't have a we didn't really get into spoilery things. So it was really all about the character, the character of Matt and Nynaeve and Elaine and Bergy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was and a deep couple general, chapters, but uh, yeah. uh, but it didn't. I mean, it, it was more of a resolution of things chapters versus a things to come chapters, except mm -hmm. for the kin, which the kin is kind of where a lot of these interactions with the Aes Sedai start getting annoying to me. But yeah, it, it's kind of like what we grumbled about with the um, the, sea with the Aes Sedai sea folk interaction there. Of, yeah. Yes, the Aes Sedai aren't the pinnacle of all that be like is set up in the beginning of the series because we start to see perception versus reality propaganda versus news um but they do start to become kind of the butt of a joke and the kin are also one of those kind of uh... yeah and and this and this one's different because it's not the seafolk culture which raise up the best of their best to be these people or the aiel wise ones which raise up the best of their best to be these people the kin are the rejects 
they were the ones that couldn't hack it in the tower. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, and, I and used they the just term pulled, earlier. There's an imposter syndrome here, big time. Yeah, and they 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 pulled together to 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 have a resource for each other, but there's still the, you know, there would be some that slipped through the cracks and just at that moment in the tower they were in the mm-hmm. wrong place at the wrong time. But as a whole, it would be people who didn't have the mental fortitude to do it. Yeah, there, there's there's an evolutionary problem there with with how they end up acting and reacting versus how they conceivably should be. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll, I, I we'll like get the there. We'll I get like there. the introduction with uh, uh, the one with the shielding ability. The introduction of people that have talents because we see that with the Asha Aman yes. later too. Where strength and the power wasn't the only thing, and one of the weaknesses in the tower. So this was a good addition. One of the weaknesses with of the tower was they only looked at your total strength, not what you could do with it. Yes, right. Which what you could do with it could could strengthen a a part to make the whole better. Mm-hmm. Which is what like the the person who's strong in shielding or the person who has an exceptional talent for healing or what have you. Yeah, that is that we do very quickly see one of the big failings of the tower, which is which is a place where Egwene is right when she complains later about this, about the the tower being too quick to throw to put people out and be done with them. Um, but next time, hopefully, we'll get to something really interesting, which also might lead to some rambling philosophical tangents, which is uh, Rand's post-coital reaction. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting scene. Yeah. So I, R- I, I R- think we'll get there. Rand is a is a blessed mix of ego and guilt. That, that, that we we see fall flying forward and oh, man that's a ever good accelerating way to put it. yeah especially especially in this book with you know to help me remember what I was talking about earlier about the best people to take power are the ones who don't want it and here at the end the very end of this book we see Rand getting a literal crown and feeling kind of smug and self satisfied about it it's a it's a big clue to what happens in the next several books yeah all right well we will get to that and hopefully see how far we get next time all right talk to you later